Amen. Okay, well, uh, I'm glad everybody's here. Thank you for being here. Um, for those of you that said beforehand, hey, I came to here, I can't wait. Thanks for putting the pressure on. I appreciate it. Amen. Uh, I mean, not really. I, I, love to, I love to talk, so it's okay. Um, but in reality, what, a lot of what I'm going to share tonight, um, I've never really shared outside of prison walls. Um, meaning a lot of times when I go in and minister in the prisons, um, this is what, you know, what you're about to hear tonight is a lot of what I share. Um, because, you know, God has anointed me um, to go in uh, and help set the captives free, right? And just to give you a little glimpse of, of how, why I know that stories are so powerful um, from people that go back in that have been there is because when I was sitting in county jail, for the last time getting ready to go do a long prison sentence i remember a, a young man coming into one of the services at, at cedric county jail and um and he and he looked right at me and he said two years ago i was sitting right in that chair uh and that's when it kind of really opened up for me and i was like hold on wait a second here if, if this guy who who did some of the, a lot of the same stuff you know that i did um is living life like it's supposed to be lived now, then I can do it. So it was just that one little seed that was sown um, helped uh, me to, to, you know, grow uh, and begin to walk in the path that God had originally created me for. Amen? Amen. So I, I've got a few notes tonight. Uh, I'm not really going to uh, share from them very much because I just want to kind of just go with wherever God leads me. But I want to tell you a little bit of my story. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit of my, my history. See, because a lot of people say, you know, I'm going to give you a testimony, right? My testimony. And then they tell you all the things that they did. But that's not really their testimony. That's their history. Amen. Their testimony is what Jesus did for them. Amen. Amen? So tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit of my history, uh, which leads into my testimony. Amen. And which leads in where God has me now. Does that make sense? So if I, if I got your permission, I'll, I'm going to share a little bit about my life. Amen? Um, so I just want to pray real fast just to open this up. So, Father, I just thank you uh, once again for just allowing me um, to be able to share. So, Father, I just I thank you for all the times that you were there that I didn't even know you were there. Uh, and as I look back and I see the times that, that I shouldn't even be here today, um, that you held me in your arms and you made sure that I got uh, to where I am now because you have so much further to take me. So I just give you the honor. So Father, I just ask that right now you begin to move me out of the way, Lord. Show through me what you showed to me, Father. And if this, if my story, my history, and, and my testimony can, can just change one person, then I've done what you've asked me to do. So Lord, I ask that if there's anybody in here that, that this story touches, that they leave here different than how they came in. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so I was trying to think over this week, what have I shared from the pulpit? You know, I'm trying to think, because I don't want them to hear what they've already heard, but then again, I only really ever get a few minutes from here whenever we're facilitating or give the offering. And, and um, so I really don't know what you've heard and what you haven't. So if some of this you've heard, great, but I, I think I'm going to share some stuff that tonight that, that you haven't heard. Um, and I never want to, I want you to make sure that you understand this. When I'm telling you some of the things that I did, please understand I am not glorifying the devil in any way. I'm not giving him any room here. But I have to tell you how bad and how lost I was in order to tell you so that you can understand how great the miracle was. A Amen? You see, because miracles begot other miracles. So see, if you can relate to the miracle that God worked in my life, then maybe you're here tonight expecting a miracle, and then God can work that miracle in your life. Our miracles may be different, but a miracle is a miracle. Amen. And I'm a firm believer in miracles. I am a firm believer in miracles. I love walking in the Holy Ghost anointing. I love seeing lives change. I love seeing healings happen. I just, I thrive on it. I love it. It's just, maybe that's the evangelistic spirit in me. I'm just like, man, that's what I want. I want to sow the seed and let Pastor Rob water it. <laughs> Amen. So you guys, I'm, here's the deal. I've got to be careful because we're recording and I've got to make sure I don't get out of it. <laughs> box and I hate that because I move but I always um I've got a couple ladies here tonight actually one uh two, yeah just one All right I've got there's two ladies in here one knows me from way way back in the days that some of the stuff I'm gonna say tonight she can be like yep yep and then I got another one that I was uh, privileged to be able to minister to in prison um and you know to see the ladies when they're out of prison and they're doing well is always a blessing but it's funny because she will know what I'm talking about when I say this I usually always made fun of the people that sat on the front row um, but the front row was always packed 
in the prison services and you know it's not so big of rooms they're kind of smaller rooms and when I get to go on I've noticed it up here too I mean the Holy Ghost spit just gets to flowing so the <laughs> so the girls on the front row I'd say don't worry about it you're just going to get some extra anointing tonight amen but just to give you a little bit of insight about my childhood so you know I, I didn't grow up in a bad home um my I, I wasn't really close to my dad at all uh um, I remember some, some times when I was a child that my mother and father, you know, were going through some rough times. So I remember seeing some things that, that you know, a child shouldn't have to see. Um, but, you know, even with that, it wasn't a bad childhood. You know, I was well taken care of. My mother and father got divorced when I was 10. Uh, my mom raised me and my two little brothers uh, the best that she could. Um, you know, we went on my dad's on the weekends and I... I I didn't really get along with him, so I never was close to him. Um, So I I, I say that to say that, you know, the enemy really used that in my life, um, my upbringing. You know, I I, I didn't really, I don't remember ever going to church when I was young. One time I remember, for some reason, I have a fond memory of sitting on some steps at a church when I was maybe 10 or 12 years old on an Easter Sunday. That's the only recollection I ever have of ever being in the church growing up. The closest thing I even knew to what a God was, was my mom used to tell me, say your prayers every night. And I'd be like, well, what do you mean? And she taught us this prayer, and now I lay me down to sleep. Had no idea what it even was, right? But that was part of our nightly routine, was to brush your teeth and say your prayers. Had no idea who I was praying. I don't even know if my mom knew who you we were praying to, right? But she was doing the best that she could. So I grew up not really knowing God. You know, Deborah went to a, a children's ministry like what we have here. Um, you know, none of that. Um, there was a time when I was probably 13 years old. I'm, I'm a firm believer um, that 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 we're. I want to say I want to make sure I'm politically correct. Um, we're born innocent. I mean, we're born guilty, but we're born innocent. Does that make sense? I mean, we're all guilty because of Adam's sin. But you know, when we're a baby, we. we even though we're born into sin, you know, we're, we're still kind of innocent at that time. And even some young kids, I mean, to tell you to steal that first cookie or whatever, you know, or say that first, then that, that sin kind of becomes alive in your life. But, you know, when God really started working with me in my life, he pinpointed the day that the, the, my age, what I call my age of accountability, meaning when I knew without a shadow of a doubt a decision I made was a sin. And I was with my stepbrother, older stepbrother and his friends, and we were at a bowling alley over there on Central and Ridge, uh, West Acres Bowling Alley. And as we came out, um, there was a bicycle there that was unlocked. And they decided, let's take this bicycle. And here I am with, you know, uh, older kids that are two, three years older than me and just trying to be cool and hang out with them. And, and uh, they said, Shannon, you ride the bike home. And I'm like, okay. You know, so I opened myself up. Um, for the enemy to be able to take his foothold and uh, begin to start to work in my life. And I remember feeling so convicted about that, but really I didn't know what that feeling was. I remember riding it to a garage and they hit it up in the building and, and for months that bothered me, but until it didn't bother me, you know? So I didn't know what was the feeling that was happening at that time other than, oh, I hope we don't get caught. But, but as I'm able to look back now, I can see how, you know, the separation from God started to happen. Amen. Even though I didn't know who God was, he knew who I was. Amen. And so years later, um, man, I grew up a good kid, to be honest with you. I loved soccer. Um, Every night you would find me and my friends out on the street playing soccer. You know, I'm talking about the street where you got a curb and that's we kick it against the curb. I mean, it didn't matter where it was. If there was a soccer ball and somewhere we could set up a goal, we were playing. So I had aspirations to play professional soccer and to join the Navy. That was my two goals in life. And um, did okay in high school, you know, senior year, I kind of got up mixed up with some wrong crowds and kind of started partying a little bit, but nothing that would really kind of, um, you know, get me in any kind of trouble at that time. It was just normal teenager stuff. Um, I did join the Navy a year after graduating high school. Um, I had to wait a year because in my senior year, I, I grew really fast and my lung ended up collapsing. Um, It it just stretched and collapsed. So I had to wait an extra year, but I did join the military. It was my grandfather was in the military. I was like, man, I was the family pride at that point. And uh, believe it or not, I even was in Operation Desert Storm for eight months. Um, You know, that's uh, so it it was just an amazing part of my life, but but also a very sad part of my life because that's when my addiction started. I was stationed in San Diego, California. Um, I, I just you know, start hanging out with some of the wrong people in the military and uh, 
made a couple wrong decisions and started to use meth. And this was in 1990. And um, ended up catching a dirty UA. And at that time, there was a zero tolerance policy. Um, so I received a dishonorable discharge um, out of the Navy. Uh, and I just came back from a war. So I was a war veteran, you know, eight months over there in Operation Desert Storm. And um, actually won a couple awards and everything. Got a couple, I you know, I don't even know what they're called anymore. But ended up getting an other than honorable discharge. And uh, I was so embarrassed and so ashamed that I didn't even wait for him to discharge me. I took off. Which now made me AWOL. Right? Because I hadn't been discharged yet. And uh, for a few months, um, I ran around with some very, very bad people. And I want to share this story with you because years later in my life, God showed me what it was. And it's, it's, I'm hoping this helps somebody tonight. Or um, anyway, so I uh, ended up um, with some people one day. And uh, we were in a car. And I was in the front seat. I was actually driving. And uh, uh, the, there was two guys in the back and a girl in the front. And... At, you know, over some money or something, I don't even remember, but one of them pulled out a gun in the back seat and stuck it to my head. And, and uh, you know, my first instinct was, whoa, hold up, swole up, and I slammed on the brakes, and, you know, he went going forward, and, and so I jumped out of the car, and, uh, you know, what's funny was, as I look back, I can see how many times the enemy tried to take me out, because I thought I was invincible. So there's these two guys, and, and they get out of the car, and I'm just standing like, put the gun down, and let's, let's see what happens. And um, the guy pointed the gun at me just like this, and he, he shot it, and nothing happened. And I was thinking, oh, this guy's shooting blanks at me. He done lost his rabbit mind. So I literally start chasing this guy, and he's running behind like that, and I'm chasing him like this. And then finally, um, I hear about three or four, boom, 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 um, and it felt like the wind got knocked out of me. True story, I actually thought the other guy... Um, that was part of it, had somehow ran up beside me and hit me in the stomach. That's what I thought, because I lost my air. So I, I kind of stopped, and, 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 and then the girl said, Shannon, you're bleeding. So she saw my back, and she said, Shannon, you're bleeding. And uh, <laughs> does anybody want to push stop on that or what? <laughs> Everybody's like, no mind, no mind, no mind. Okay. All right, here we go. Oh, my gosh. That's Sam. That's Pastor Sam's phone. <laughs> wow. It's Stella. <laughs> Probably saying, where are you at? No. Okay. Wow. All right. I'm so proud of you guys. It was none of yours. Amen. So this young lady said, Shannon, you're bleeding. And she's behind me. And I look down and I see blood right here coming out. It's just right there on my chest. And, you know, all of a sudden I start thinking, holy moly, you know, I have a bullet hole right there and who knows what's right there? Your heart. So I really thought I was going to die. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to die. And here's the craziest thing in the world. When that happened, I remember thinking, huh, I wonder if I'm going to see a bright light. Now, remember, I didn't know anything about God. I had just seen some movies that when people die, they see a bright light. So this is what I'm thinking in my mind. I'm like, oh, I wonder if I'm going to see a bright light, right? And then I started to feel this burn from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. It was unlike anything I could even uh, explain to you other than the closest thing I can tell you is, is if you took a lighter and, and you got it real close to your skin, but you didn't touch your skin, and you know that, that heat melting kind of feeling you know, that's what my inside of my body felt like. And it was consistent. And I'm, I'm starting to lose my breath. And then I remember just the girl in the car pulling up beside me and they threw me in the back seat. The two guys that were, you know, the one guy that shot me and another guy, they took off running. And uh, they threw me in this car and, and drove me to a, a 7-Eleven. And in San Diego back then, the 7-Eleven and the Pizza Huts were connected together. And uh, I was, they pulled me out in this parking lot and they call the ambulance and the ambulance shows up and there's all these people around me because I'm bleeding. I'm bleeding out of my chest. And the ambulance gets there and, and they start cutting off, cutting off my clothes. And, and here's my mind. This is what's crazy. This is how lost I was. And this is how much of a, an addiction I was. As I remember laying there thinking, man, I'm butt naked in a Pizza Hut parking lot. <laughs> and then that's when it started. I, 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 I was sitting there and I was burning I was, you know, could barely breathe. Uh, I was thinking I was going to die. 
um, was thinking, okay, am I going to see a bright light? What, what's going to happen? And, and all of a sudden, I just started to see, I'm going to explain it as like a wall. But it wasn't a wall, it was, it, but it was dark, it was black, and it was empty. And it kept closing on me like this. And I was fighting hard. I was like, you know, I did everything in, in the world. The ambulance is there, and they're doing this, and they're, you know, getting me in the ambulance, and they're doing all stuff, and this wall just keeps, keeps trying to close. And I'm, I'm starting to get scared now because I'm like, it was this, just this emptiness that I cannot even explain, this blackness that was just, and I started to get scared. I'm like, what is this? So I'm fighting to stay awake because I can barely breathe. I, I think I'm dying. Um, and then, believe it or not, I started to think, anybody ever see the Patrick Swayze movie Ghost? And there was a couple of those sections in the movie where someone who was unsaved, when they died, those demons came out and grabbed them. I thought about that movie. And I was like, holy moly. You know, not, I wasn't seeing demons or nothing, but I had this emptiness, and I'm like, what is this darkness? So I, I get to the hospital, and, and they start sticking tubes everywhere they can stick tubes in, and they put me on this heart machine, and, and, and the, uh, you know, the heart machine, you could hear it, it's going boom, boom. Boom, boom. And the last thing I heard, and I'm still fighting to stay awake because this darkness, it just keeps trying to close. It just keeps trying to close. And then they put that thing over my mouth. And they, the last thing I heard before I lost consciousness, you know, because they, they knocked me out was we're losing him. And then everything went dark. And, and then I ended up waking up, obviously. And I, I looked down. And when I woke up, I said, wow, I wonder if I'm in heaven. Oh, no, I looked over and I seen my mom. My mom was there, and I thought I was, might be in heaven. My mom wasn't passed away, but my mom lived in, was in Kansas, and I was in California, so how was my mom there? So I'm thinking, man, maybe I'm in heaven, not even knowing what heaven was, right? And then I look down, and I see staples from here all the way down to here, and I say, yeah, no, probably not in heaven. And um, to make a long story short, uh, I actually um, got addicted to morphine while I was in the hospital. Um, they put me on a machine, and and let me do the little, every seven minutes I could squirt it. And I remember my mom asking him, is this addictive? And the doctor said, no, not when it's given for pain. Yeah, right? That's why we're, <laughs> amen, yeah. So, yeah, so I was actually, I had to be on Vicodin pills for two years after getting out of the hospital. Okay. So you would think in a person's life, after a tragedy like that happens, right, that a person would be like, man, I am done. I'm not even, you know what, I'm going to get into whatever, I'm going to go find some people to hang, you know, some good people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to church or whatever, but that's not what happened. My addiction actually spun off farther uh, and deeper than you could ever imagine. I ended up coming back to Wichita, I ended up getting my discharge from the military, um, ended up getting arrested while I was in San Diego and spent six months in a San Diego jail, and then they gave me a thing called sheriff's parole, and they let me come to Wichita uh, so I thought that was going to be the, my change in life, and uh, it wasn't. I just, I just kept finding reasons to stay in a lifestyle that kept me in bondage. See, little did I know years ago when I had made that decision to steal that bicycle that the enemy started to put me in a bondage. Amen. And he had his grips around me. And because I had no relationship with, with Jesus, it was easy for him to, to toy with me and to use me for his will because I knew nothing else. And for the next 15 years, I did some very bad things. Um, I was in and out of jail consistently. I, I, I put more drugs in my body than, than any average man should ever do. Um, there was a time in my life uh, where when I went to the hospital one time because I thought I was having a heart attack and they x-rayed my heart and they said the muscles around my heart were so stressed they didn't even know how I was walking. And, but still yet, I continued uh, to, to keep using drugs. So there is, you know, most addicts, most people who use, have used in the past will tell you this, they shouldn't be here. That, that we should, I should by in no way, shape or form, just from the bullet that I got shot with, let me tell you why I didn't die. I, that's another thing I did, because here's, when I said I got shot right here, it's in the heart. It was with a 38 caliber pistol. And what happened was the bullet hit my rib. It broke in half. Half the bullet stayed in there. The other half shot down. It broke three ribs, went through my lung. Went through my stomach, hit my diaphragm, went back out, went back through my stomach, and then out my back. Okay, so, so all that now, has anybody in here ever had a broken rib? One of the most painful breaks there is. I felt none of that. All I felt was the heat. 
So all that damage was done in there. So it's a, it's a, a miracle I'm alive today from all that damage I was in. They actually had to staple my stomach back together. It was in four pieces. I had just ate a ham sandwich and it hadn't digested yet. So the, actually the ham sandwich floated out and sat in the bottom of my lung, caused a big infection in my lung, right? It's just crazy. I mean, crazy. Um, fast forward in some of the times, some of the things I've did. I, I've been in cars before where we're just high as a kite and, and doing everything under the sun that you can imagine. And I remember flying around corners and one time we was in a residential area and just came, went flying around this corner and we hit a curb and the car actually flipped up uh, and, and it just rolled. And it, and it rolled so much that I remember the car was smashed on top of us like this. We're sitting in the back and I'm thinking, the police are coming. We, I literally, it was me and the guy, we literally crawled out. I've got cuts from my face all the way down from the glass that's on me and my, scraping myself out of this wrecked car. Um, you know, so when we got out of the car, we, got, we shouldn't have survived that. We, we just shouldn't have. I've, I've been in places where I've had guns put to my head. Um, you know, I've been in places where I, I've taken drugs, the same drug that I watched another person OD on right in front of me and die, you know. So I just, I, I, the enemy just used me mightily in areas. So fast forward, because I want to get to some of the good parts. Amen. You know, I just want to tell you how, how bad my life was. And you know what's crazy is, is here's what's, what's sad, is my story I just told, um, you know, maybe other than the gunshot or whatever, most, person who's, uh, most people who's ever been addicted story is the exact same. I mean, we're all, it's, it's, that's, that's how, you know, the enemy's not very smart. He, but we're all obviously not, not, he's a little smarter than us in that area because he keeps using the same thing over and over. And you know what? I know not all of you have been addicted in here, maybe not to drugs. Maybe you've been addicted to something else, but I'm going to tell you, it's the number one most rampant thing um, that the enemy has used all throughout time to destroy people, to destroy lives, to destroy. And I can't tell you how many lives I destroyed that he used me to destroy, whether I introduced him to drugs, whether I did something to him, you know, whatever it may be. But I ruined, I damaged a lot of lives. And, you know, in and out of jail quite a bit. I ended up going to prison one time. And I remember I, did, I got an eight-month sentence for simple possession of cocaine. And, and uh, I would go and I'd do four months in El Dorado. And I did four months in work release. And I got out of prison thinking, prison ain't nothing. And so once again, another thing in my life where God was just kind of giving me a calling card right? Trying to work with me. And, and I remember, you know, thinking a little bit about God when I was in prison that time, but not really that much. And, um, you know, but I, because I was starting to learn that I didn't like church folk, um, because all, most of them that I had met at that time, you know, looked at me, uh, like I was scum. Does that make sense? And, uh, so I get out and instead of, instead of trying to do things right, I just became even worse. Um, and, and, and just kept going. And I remember it was 2003, I was standing in the room, and uh, at this time, uh, I already had two daughters. Um, I lost my oldest daughter. Um, I, there were some times in this 15 years where I tried to be sober. One of them was when I had my first daughter. Her name was Skylar, and uh, she was born with cerebral palsy. And for the first year and a half of her life, I was sober. Um, not for any other reason, but just because I was trying to be a dad. But see, I never dealt with the disease. And so it was still there. It was still rampant in my life. And uh, so I made one wrong decision a year and a half later because I was bored sitting at home. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go out and hang out with some friends. Yeah, and then the next thing I know for the next two years of her life, I'm high. Um, she passed away when she was three and a half. The last time I ever seen my daughter um, was the morning she passed away. I went to work on a Saturday morning. I held her in my arms high as a kite and uh, laid her down and then left. And two hours later, I got a call from my wife at the time, Belinda, and said, Skylar's dead. Um, so basically what had happened was she was born with cerebral palsy. She had an operation on her legs and they uh, put her in a cast uh, so that her legs, her muscles could form right so she could possibly one day learn how to walk because at three and a half, she never walked, talked, or crawled. Her cerebral palsy was in a lot of different spots in her brain. So um, the, the operation, she had caught pneumonia and her body just couldn't fight it off. So that's another thing the Lord just allowed, just bless me to be able to see my daughter one more time, right? That's another one of those times when you would think that a person would try to change their life. And I didn't. I just let it fuel my addiction even more. As a matter of fact, I even got worse. I had another daughter, um, Dakota, who is now 22 years old, was nine months at that time. She was nine months old. Um, and I just lost everything. 
I went rampant. And I remember it was 2003. Um, Skyler passed away in 99. Uh, it's 2003, and I'm sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a kitchen. There's a dining room right there. And I look out to that dining room, and there's people around it getting high. And I just remember thinking, man, I don't like those people. And they don't like me. The only reason we're here is because of what's on that table. And as God is my witness, this is what I said. I looked up. Now, I'm going to tell you how I said my prayer, okay, because I'm a firm believer, and you've got to talk to God where you're at. You know, because if, 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 if I would have went to hearing thou as thou as thee as thus as they, I would have been like, yeah, deuces, I'm out. So I just looked up and I said, dude, if you're real, get me out of this because I've tried for years and I can't get out of it, meaning I can't stop. I don't know how. So if you're real, get me out of this. Two weeks later, I get arrested for a child support case. See, I was a little behind on child support, obviously, because I'm out getting high and not doing what I'm supposed to do. And I get picked up on a child support case. And, and I remember as I go into the Sedgwick County Jail for the 167th time, I'm thinking to myself, huh, I'm out of where I was. I'm, I set my court date off for two weeks, so I was going to be in there for two weeks. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to get three hots in a cot. Like, I don't think I really like the way you answer prayers, but I, I knew that I knew that I knew that he had answered that prayer. I knew I was in jail because God put me there. I don't know. I, don't, I can't tell you how I knew that because I still didn't even know who God was. Amen. I just remember looking up saying, if you're real, get me out of this. Two weeks later, I'm in Sedgwick County Jail with a two-week-out court case, and I'm thinking, huh. Okay, if you put me here, then I'm going to get to know who you are. And I wrote what they called a kite. That's what we call them, kites. And I wrote it to the chaplain. And, and at that time, it was Chaplain Steve Davis. And I said, I would like a Bible, please. And I get this Bible, and the cover of that Bible changed my life. I got it. It was a paperback Bible. And on the cover of the paperback, it had two, two hands like this, handcuffed, and the chain was broke. And on the cover of the Bible, it said free on the inside. I said free on the inside. I ain't never been free on the outside. And I sat down myself in a, in a cell with four walls and a Bible. And God himself introduced me to his son, Jesus Christ. And I accepted him in that cell on my knees. No preacher, no nothing. It was just God saying, this is who I am. This is my son. This is what he did for you. Get to know him. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. So quit talking about religion. If you're looking for Pastor Sam's phone, tell him it was ringing during, during yeah, service. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Go get my phone, will you please? But he said it's about relationship, not religion. Get that out of your head. Those people are my people, so I need you to know what they're really about. So I had to set you down so you could get to know who I am so that you can know who they are. Whew. That was a valuable lesson, man. And I'm telling you, I soaked that Bible up. I, I just remember reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John like 20 times before I even could go any further. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I wanted to know anything and everything. Look, doesn't Derry Walker know we're in service? What is wrong with these heathens we have in church these days? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Anyways, um, I started to fill out for Bible studies. Man, I remember getting all these outside Bible studies that come in. As a matter of fact, I still have them to this day because when you finish a Bible study and you send it in, they send you these little cool certificates, right? So I have all these certificates that I got. And, and it came to the point, so, so two weeks later, I, I go to court and... Uh, and, you know, I go in front of the judge, and I'm thinking I'm a new man. I'm two weeks, man. I gave my life to Christ. My life is different. I'm going to be changed, right? And I go in front of the judge, and they put me on probation, and I walk back to my cell, and I'm just happy as can be. God is so good. Hey, amen. And, I, and I'm sitting there, and, you know, any of y'all that have been to jail, you know, we're sitting there in the day room, and we're waiting to hear those famous words, roll to go, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there. And later on, about 7 o'clock, I go and I'm like, hey, have my release papers came yet? The judge said that I was getting probation. And they say, oh, we forgot to give you these. And they handed me a paper, and what it basically was is called a WAP charge, uh, meaning I had gotten arrested a year and a half before that, and they released me without prejudice, but having two years to bring the charge back up on me. And they said, yes, this came in for you. They, the, a, a case of simple possession um, 
they went ahead and brought back up. So your court date's in two months. It's my first test to see how it was, how God, how good God really was. You understand? Because at that time, it was, I was at a crossroads. It was either, man, I'm done. I've been sitting here praying to you, right? Or I could say, okay, you've got me here for a little bit longer. So I must not have everything you've got for me yet. And that was my mindset. That's what I took. I started to have Bible studies in the, they used to call me, I didn't, it was funny. Derry would be the one to talk to us because I remember when we started Moses, I'm like, I am no preacher at all. What's crazy was in the county jail, they used to call me preacher. And when I first started getting mentored by Derry, you know, when we was talking about some things and anyway, so it, it was kind of prophesying over me and I didn't even know they were prophesying over me, but I'm doing Bible studies in the jail, right? Uh, just, I just soaked up everything I could while I was there. Now, I want to tell you, change just didn't happen like that because I was doing Bible studies in the morning, don't get me wrong, but at nighttime I was still playing spades and pinochle and, and uh, you know, all that stuff. Now, what I did notice, though, what did start to happen to me, the first thing that God cleaned up in my life was my language. You know, because if you're from the street, uh, first off, I was in the military, okay? So the F word is second language in the military, First time I ever came home on leave, I'm sitting at the table with my mom, and I said, hey, mom, can you pass the effing salt? She about fell out of her chair. I'm like, what? I didn't even know what I said, right? Because it became such a part of my language, because that's just the military. Everybody says the F word, every other word. And then 15 years on the street, okay, I mean, it was just, and then in jail and prison, it was just part of my language. But I came across the scripture in the Bible that said, let no foul language come out of your mouth. You know, I, I don't know if that's the exact words, but you understand there's a few scriptures there that just say, hey, you know, watch what you say, right? So I remember trying to just say different things, and I'd be playing spades, and you know, when in jail, you try to, you got some, there's some drama behind it, you know, you flip the cards up, and you stand up, and you know, right? You, Take that, you know, and, and instead of saying the F-bomb, I would say, take that, fudge knocker, you know, <laughs> fire truck. And, man, they would always laugh at me and make fun of me, right? And I'll never forget it. We were there playing a game, and I had this, my partner was always this black guy. He was, he was in the county jail with me the whole time I was there. And there was a time, and he, you know, did play, made a play, and he said, mm. he said the F word, and then he went, Hoop. He said, I'm sorry, Shannon. And it hit me. Because I wasn't preaching the gospel to none of them. They just seen me in the morning doing my thing, right? And people would come and study with me. And then at nighttime, all of a sudden I said, holy smokes. God, they're, they're changing how they act because they see you in me. And because they see you in me, they're getting convicted on how they talk. I just remember that like it was yesterday. I was like, holy smokes. You don't even, matter of fact, I tell most people in prison this. Because when, when you're in prison and you start following God, man, you can't wait to get out because you want to get up on a pulpit and you want to preach. You're like, you're going to change the world. Pastor, I don't need to clean no toilets. You just need to put me right up there on the stage on Sunday morning. I'm, I'm ready to preach. Okay? Right? I, I, I don't even know why I said that. Oh, I remember. This is what I tell most people. Sometimes the best way to preach the gospel until the Lord prepares you and, and, and promotes you is to never say a word. Let the gospel preach through you, right? Let the gospel be shown in your life. And that's what was happening to me in jail was the gospel was showing through my life and it was starting to change people. And then people would say, okay, Shannon, what is this thing that, that you're doing every morning that causes you to be able to sit with us, the, uh, you know, every other word saying this and you can keep from doing it. Not to be in like, like you're some high holy roller. We can just tell, man, you're changing. And, and uh, you know, so that's what it was. So anyway, two months come, and uh, I, I'm thinking everything's good, right? And my court date, I think I'm, the next morning I wake up, and I'm thinking I'm going to court. And they said, ah, oh, they pulled another WAP case up on you. <laughs> so this court date's six months. And it's now simple possession with a prior simple possession, so I went from a severity level four to severity level two. I was looking at 12 months probation, and now I jumped to a 55-month prison sentence. That was on the grid. And uh, six months till I go to court. And I'm just thinking, wow. My now, I'm two months into this. My life's completely different. People are coming in that I was hanging out on the streets with in jail, and they don't even really know who I am anymore, right? And, 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 and now six months later, here I am in jail for eight months in Cedric County Jail, which is like five years in, in maximum prison, trust me. And uh, my life's completely different. 
You know, I learned so much about Jesus. I was so on fire. Um, LaDon and I were friends at that time, and we were just writing letters. This, that's how LaDon and I fell in love was when I was in jail and in prison. We fell in love over letters. We still have every letter we wrote each other the whole five years I was in prison. So um, anyways, I, I, I go. So eight months passes, and this is when it gets real. I go in front of the judge, and, and for some of you guys that are sitting here that maybe have gotten charged after that, and you're familiar with Senate Bill 123, well, that bill hadn't took place yet when I had this sentence. So see, now you can have the same charge that I had, that I did 55 months for, you can get probation up to three times. When I, when I got charged with that, the bill, the law had been passed, it just hadn't went into effect. It went, go, started to get into effect on July 1st. I got sentenced in March, so my court-appointed attorney was like, don't worry about it, the judge is going to, you know, retroactive, they're letting everybody out. Man, I go in there and go to court. I didn't even get to say a word. I stood up. The judge said, yep, the, grills, the, the grid says this, this. Yep, I'm going to give you 55 months. I said, I looked at my lawyer and I said, did he just say 55 months? I thought you said I was going home. What was crazy about that is, is right before that, a guy who had um, committed, so his charge was conspiracy to commit murder. Um, he didn't pull the trigger, but he was there when the trigger was pulled. He got sentenced 33 months. I literally, my two simple possession charges equaled $70 worth of street value cocaine. But because it was a simple possession with a prior conviction of a simple possession, it, I got 55 months for it. And I remember walking back to my cell, and I was shook. I was just like, wow, God, I'm, okay, I've given my life to you, and I know that everything that happens that you orchestrate, but that's a long time. And I walked into the cell. And man, I wish for the world I could remember that guy's name, but the brother, the black guy who, who was just my, my ride or die in there, he knew something was wrong. And he came up to me and he looked me in the eye and he said, preacher, he said, remember when Peter walked on the water? Don't look at the storm. And I was just like, wow. So I went and sat down and I said, Lord, if I'm getting ready to go do this 48 month on a 55 month sentence because I've already been in county jail for eight months, then I'm going to go get everything you got for me. And I went to prison with a smile on my face, knowing that eight months before that I had said a prayer, Lord, get me out of this. And he got me out. And it wasn't up to me to how he was going to keep me out. But I can tell you this, as I look back on it now, if I would have went home at that time, I might not have made it. You see, because after spending that much time in prison, I needed that much foundation. I'm going to tell you why, because this is when it gets really good. See, I, I uh, man, I was blessed all in prison. A lot of you guys have heard this part of my testimony, that while I was in prison, the first principle God taught me in prison was on tithing. I, I'm in prison, and obviously I had robbed, stolen, cheated, and, and, and lost everything I'd ever owned. Okay, so I had no money. The only money I ever had on my books was LaDonna every two weeks would send me 20 bucks. God bless her. And my mom once a month would send me 20 bucks. Right. That's the only money I had to my name. I go into prison. I'm mowing El Dorado Lake. I make 60 cents a day. I actually got to level two. So I made a dollar five a day. But every morning, man, I'm watching Kenneth Copeland, T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer. Right, man. And they're talking about tithing and, and you know, the principles of God and, 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 and and in Malachi and da da da, and I'm just like I'm eating this up, and I'm just like, man, I want to be a tither. I want to give. You know, I just I want to give all that I got, anything that I can. But Lord, why are you teaching me this now? I still got four years left. I don't have any money, and it was just like audible, just like he was standing right in front of me. He said, uh, "You make a dollar five a day, which is thirty two thirty two dollars and some odd cents a month." And I was like, wow. So for the next forty some months. Faithfully, I sent in three dollars and some odd cents to whoever was blessing me that month, whether it was TD Jakes or Joyce Myers or Kenneth Copeland. I would send in my little form nine saying I would like to send three dollars and thirty seven cents to TD Jakes, da da da, right? Every single month. Now, let me tell you the miracle in that. See, because I stood on that. The Bible says, This is what I stood on, where it says, Bring me what's mine, stop robbing me. Bring me what's mine and watch if I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing big enough that will last you all your life. And I was like, man, I like that. But the next verse is why I became a tither. Because then it goes on to say, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. See, I, I started to learn that demons were real. 
I had started to learn that evil was real. See, that's why I looked up and said, if you're real, because I didn't know if I believed in God or not. I did not believe in him. I just didn't know. But what I did know is that there was evil. You see, I had spent a lot of time with what uh, addicts like to call shadow people. <laughs> and them shadow people are very real. I didn't know that. We all, when we're high, we're thinking, you know, we're paranoid. No, those are demons. And they're watching you, and they're watching your every move, and they're making sure that you're doing their bidding. A amen? And um, anyway, so I, uh, man, I lost my train of thought. got on that demon thing. Where was I before that? Tithing. Thank you very much. So I'm like, I couldn't fight them demons. They were still a little bit stronger than me. I knew who I was in Christ, right? But I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure out a kingdom man, a kingdom principles, right? I'm still find, finding out that I have dominion, but I didn't know how to act on that dominion yet. So when I seen that I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, I said, man, all I have to do is tithe and you'll fight the demons for me? I'm in. So I started to tithe. That's originally why I started to tithe. And, uh, you know, the last 11 months I'm in prison, I got blessed to be able to go to work release. And uh, I ended up being able to sell cars. I was the last person in work release they ever let sell cars. I worked 14 hours a day at, at Rusty Eck Ford. They took a chance on me. Uh, Les Eck actually paid $3,000. He made some phone calls. He heard that before I went to prison that I was a coal car salesman. Uh, and I was, a, I was one of those ones that I was going to say what it took to sell a car. And so I remember when I got the job, I remember praying, Lord... I don't know how I'm going to do this because I can't be dishonest anymore. And he said, Shannon, if you'll be honest and you'll work as you're working unto me, you'll sell more cars than you've ever sold in your life. So I got this job and, and uh, the first day I'm there, a, a car pulls up and, and, and I remember going out and welcoming. I look and on the rear view mirror, a cross is hanging and I sold a car. And then the very next person I talk to, the car pulls up, and there's a I love Jesus on the bumper sticker. I'm like, man, you are something else. <laughs> and I sold a car. So anyway, for the next 11 months, I made an average of, I ended up, work release charged you 25% of your gross uh, to, to, to be in prison and, go, and to be in work release. So 25% of your gross. By the time I left in 11 months, I had paid over $60,000 for a room and board to be a prisoner in the Kansas Department of Corrections. Now, I didn't, wasn't tripping. I, I remember bringing my paycheck in thinking, ooh, because the guards had to take it and sign it. And some of the, at this time, those guards were only making like 12 bucks an hour. And could you imagine someone who you know their history because you see the charge and brings a paycheck and it's for $18,000? You know, and, and I just remember, thank you, officer. And I would go and I would just sit in my bunk, <laughs> right? I would just sit in my bunk, you know, um, so anyway, but I got out of prison. The day I got out of prison, I'm going back to that tithing thing. I came in completely broke with nothing. I get out, and because I was bringing in so much money, they allowed me to send all kinds of money out, you know, to pay off these bills and this and that. I had like three repos. On my, I think my credit score was like a 310, okay? <laughs> I don't even think that's possible, and I think that's what it was. So I paid off all, this, all, this, all these old bills, cause, and, I, and the day I get out of prison, they hand me a check for $27,000. So I get out of prison debt-free with $27,000. That, that's a miracle. Now, first off, that could kill most people. It, <laughs> she said, mm. it, So, be, you know, anyways, I remember I, I, I went and got a car, bought my daughter a whole new set of clothes, got myself clothes because when I went to prison, I was a buck oh five soaking wet. I got out, I was like 260, you know. <laughs> you know, all them ramen noodle burritos, boy, they will do something to you. <laughs> it will do something bad to you, okay. But boy, we made some mean burritos up in there. <laughs> One of these Wednesdays, I got to get a bunch of uh, 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 ex-convicts together and we got to make a prison gumbo for you folks, okay. You'll love it. <laughs> You'll love it. Um, so, you know, for the, for the next 11 months, uh, I was living life, and I was, I was doing good. I was working, you know, I was, and being in the car business is a hard place to be saved. Um, but I remember I went there every day because I wanted to represent well. Um, it wasn't always easy. I'm not going to say that, that I was always, you know, there, uh, Shannon was, 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 was taken out of the hood, right? But a lot of the hood was still in Shannon. A amen? So there were some things that the Lord was still sanctifying in me and still chipping off the old block. Amen. And, but I was a lot. I wasn't who I used to be. 
and my life was completely different. And for 11 months, I just remember working, and I remember going to church, and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, LaDonna and I were dating, and, and everything was going good, and, and uh, I decided, I, I hooked up with an old friend from high school, somehow, some way. And I remember, I don't even know how, but we were somewhere, and a line of cocaine was offered to me, and I did it. Didn't even, it was, it was like, not even a thought, I just... And, uh, and then I remember going home and going to bed and I woke up the next morning and this is, this is how much the enemy still had a foothold on me that I didn't know. You know, I'm a, you know the scripture where it says, uh, whenever a demon leaves a person, it goes and it searches, it searches through the dry places trying to, trying to seek rest. And when it finds none, it goes back to the house that it was in, right? And when it gets to the house, it finds that house uh, uh, clean and in order and, and swept up, right? Empty, clean, swept up, right? And then he leaves and go get seven more and then goes back in the state of that man is worse than it ever was. I owe that scripture. See, that was happening in my life. I did that line of cocaine. I woke up the next morning. See, my, my house was swept up. And it was clean. It was in order, but it was empty. And, and, and I remember thinking when I woke up, I was like, I did a line of cocaine last night and went to bed. My mind all of a sudden went to, you can be a social user again. Isn't that crazy? I just spent 48 months in prison just on with, in the word with God. And here I am 11 months later. Because, see, I tell people, be careful when you get out of prison because prison is easy. Well, what do you mean prison's easy, Shannon? You're locked up. Yeah, the guards are buttheads. Yeah, the food's terrible, right? But here's the deal. you got all the time in the world to change your life. When you get out, real life happens, and, and life is fast. Amen? Life happens to you fast. And here I am. I wake up, and I think that. And let me tell you, for the next three months, I was in a worse addiction than I ever was before I went to prison. The reason I say that is because I wasn't doing the things that I used to do, but I was hiding it better than I ever could. Because I was bringing home ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month, so no one knew how much money I was spending, right? Poor LaDonna knew nothing about drugs. I'm getting high in her bathroom. She has no idea, okay, because she's never done a drug in her life, poor girl, right? It's funny when I tell that story now because she's still like to this day, I cannot believe you are doing that. But after about three months, people started noticing something, right? And, you know, what had happened was, so anyway, I'm in my apartment or my house, and I, and I just remember thinking, all of a sudden, I came to my senses that Holy Spirit, I had quenched it so much, but it still had one, one shot left. And I just remember it kind of like uppercutted me, right? And, it, and, and I was sitting there thinking, what in the world am I doing? I'm like, man, the Lord has brought me so far, and look what I have. I can't afford to lose everything. I'm on parole. Thank God I was on write-in status, so I wasn't getting called in. I'm thinking, I can't do this. So I called LaDonna and said, LaDonna, I need you to come over and, and just sit with me tonight and pray over me because tomorrow morning I'm taking myself to a rehab. See, I'd been to 50 rehabs already, and none of them have ever worked, but I knew I had to get somewhere just to get alone. I had to get away from everybody for a minute, and I knew I could do it in a rehab. And LaDonna came over, and believe it or not, I fell asleep that night. Now, she has a whole other story about that night. You know, she doesn't know. She born, was raised Southern Baptist. So, you know, that whole speaking in tongues and demon thing and all that kind of stuff, she knew nothing about. But she said she heard some things come out of my mouth that night that there was more than just me in that room. And she was scared to death, she, but she held on to me the whole night, had her legs and her arms wrapped around me because my body was shaking. And she said that I was laughing at myself and I would say things to her. Um, but I was sleeping. I, you know, so... Just an amazing uh, story that LaDonna has. You'll have to ask her about it sometime. But that morning, I, I get up, and we go to Valley Hope. And, uh, and I walk into Valley Hope, and I turn myself in. And, and uh, here I, I, they take me to a room. And, man, I remember it like it was yesterday. I walk into this room, and, and right here on the night stands a Bible. And the bed's right there. And it was like, it was like Jesus himself was sitting on the nightstand. I, I, for some reason, I, I, remember it's like, I remember him sitting on the Bible because I remember thinking, that's kind of weird that Jesus is sitting on the Bible. That's what I was thinking in my head, right? But and then he just picks it up. And he says, son, how did you ever expect to win the war without your sword? Watch this. It hit me. Holy smokes. Every day in, for 48 months in prison, I was in the word, man. I was soaking up the word, right? Just reading because I had all the time in the world to read the word. I get out and true, and even in work release, as you go back and you're sitting there because there's nothing to do, you, I got in the word. 
But when I got out and life hit me, I had realized when I looked at that Bible and when, when I caught that vision that I had not picked up my Bible one time since I had been out of prison. See, I had it all in here, but I wasn't feeding in here. And as God is my witness, the moment I got that revelation that it was because of the word that I was overcoming my addiction, do you know from that day on, and it's been 14 years now, I have never even thought about using. I have never had an urge to use. I have never even, I mean, my, I've been able to go in, in houses where they were still smoking crack. Now, I don't make that a habit. Don't get me wrong, because even though I'm not scared to go into the enemy's playground to take back what he stole from me and get some other things while I'm there that he stole from you, amen, I also know don't play. Your, 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 your enemy is, is a liable foe, so don't play. You've got dominion, but be careful where you take your power, amen? And, and I just never have. I haven't never even thought about it. And it was all, because see, in that scripture I gave you where it says, he goes back and he finds the house swept up, put in order, but empty, because I always thought, man, how is the, the person's stage going to be worse then than it was before? Is because the house was empty. So there was more room for more demons to sit in. Because the house wasn't filled with the word of God. See, my brain had it, but my spirit was starving. And, I, and, and from that day, I just went. So um, fast forward a couple years. You know, matter of fact, I, my first message I ever preached was in that rehab. I almost got kicked out. <laughs> LaDonna came up. There was a room, about 20 people in there, man. And I just gave them the word of God. Not even knowing that, you know, I mean, it's funny how the Lord, when he shows me this, you know, so many years back, I'm like, man, I was preaching in jail. I was preaching there. Never even knew I was preaching, but he was using me, right? And uh, it was amazing. I think five people gave their lives to the Lord. Didn't even really know what that meant at that time. Um, The next morning I get called in. You can't be talking about Jesus to people. (laughs) And... True story, when I graduated, um, when the counselor had a couple's, uh, LaDonna and I weren't married yet, um, but we were, we were getting married. She looked right at LaDonna, and she told LaDonna, she goes, I, I, I don't want to scare you, but Shannon's going to fail. I'm in the rehab, getting ready to graduate, and she looks at LaDonna and says, Shannon's going to fail. And LaDonna's freaking out. I remember, she don't know nothing. Whoa, oh my God, you're going to be kidding me. I can't, I'm not going to do this. And I'm looking at her like, what? She goes, yeah, anybody that can go through a rehab for 30 days with a smile on their face hadn't got down to the root. But see, but she didn't know what I was smiling about. You see, I had found that, that and don't get me wrong, I love the 12-step program. I think it's great. I think it's helped a lot of people. But in re- reality, sobriety comes with one step. And that step is Jesus Christ. Amen. See, with him, everything else falls into place. All them other tw- uh, uh, 12 steps made sense when I had the one step. A- amen? So I could go through those 12 steps saying, man, with the one step, I can whoop anything. You know what I mean? So, so I didn't, he doesn't, he's not going to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. He's, he's going to fail and he hasn't got to the roots. No, I know that I, the one that lives in me is stronger than he who lives in the world. So my addiction is gone. You'll never hear me stand up in front of any meeting, anybody and say, hi, my name is Shannon and I'm an addict because I am not. My disease was covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. I am set free and delivered. Now I will get up and say, hi, my name is Shannon and I'm an addict survivor. You see, because I survived the disease of addiction. The disease that kills so many people, the disease that destroys so many lives. Guess what? Jesus Christ <coughs> paid the price for it, and I'm set free. So I'm not going to put that curse on myself. Right. Amen? Amen? I'm not saying anything bad about anybody that says that. I understand, but I'm telling you, man, your words are powerful. So don't get up and say, hi, my name is, and I'm an addict. Oh. Because all you did was just curse yourself. I know it's a disease, but say, hi, my name is, and I'm going to whoop that thing called addiction. Yeah. Amen. And I don't care who you are if you go to those meetings. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you've never been addicted to drugs, but man, you're struggling with pornography right now. Maybe you've got a gambling issue and nobody knows about it because it's one of those secret sins. And you come to church on a Sunday morning and man, you want to, but you go home and you can't stay off from that computer. Man, the same Jesus that set me free from crack cocaine and uh, crack cocaine and methamphetamines can set you free from pornography. Guys, I struggled with it. For years, even after my addiction, because when you're in the military and you're in prison twice and you're in jail a lot, it becomes like second nature. I never knew it was a sin. So there's things in my life, even after getting delivered from addiction, that the Lord had to say, boy, I ain't done with you yet. So probably about, gosh, how long ago? About five years ago, six years ago, um, I got the opportunity... uh, 
I was sitting with a, a man, his name was Spencer Lindsay. Some of you guys might know him. He was the founder of Working Men of Christ. And I met him, and, and uh, he was going to the South Campus. And I, LaDonna and I were married now, and we'd been going to the North Campus. And I'd heard that he was in prison. I knew a little bit about his story. He knew a little bit about my story. And uh, we met one day for coffee. And, and he's like, man, I, 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 get in, I, I teach in the prisons. He's like, man, I want to get you in the prison with me. And, and uh, I'd already had this, this mentor badge because, believe it or not, um, when Sam Brownback first launched this initiative called the Mentoring for Success program where um, people could mentor people in prison and they include, included ex-felons, okay, to mentor people, I was one of the first ones that they worked, that they had in the program. They actually came to Word of Life South, did a, did a little teaching. We had a guy there, his name was Rick Henson, and uh, he was part of it. So I went to the training and then they found out that I was a former inmate. So they said, we want to use you as a guinea pig and for a new uh, launching program that we're doing. So I was the first ex-inmate to Skype into a prison to talk to another inmate in Lansing Prison. Um, so when Spencer starts telling me he wants to take me to prison, I already had a badge because they had already piloted that program. Um, and I started to go into prisons with them. And I found out why the Lord had pulled me through everything he pulled me through. Because, see, he, everything that, that I was using on that side, that the enemy was, was, was prostituting my, my gifts, the Lord gave to me, and he designed me with those gifts for his purpose. But I let the enemy prostitute me, so those same gifts that I had the power to, to, to walk into a room and make people think I was carrying a gun and be able to get their money and take all their stuff, right, was actually the power that God gave me to walk in a room with his presence and help the, a lost person find Jesus. Amen? And, and it's funny because I love when I talk to people, when I'm ministering to people on and we'll talk, and I'll be like, you know, what's different in your life? And they'll say, I found God. I'll be like, really? I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> you mean he found you? Because yeah. I know he searched for me for many years. He kept sending me calling cards. And even though those calling cards in life sometimes are bad, you know, my daughter passing, me getting shot. Sometimes you're like, man, that, you know, but those were, that was God saying, hey, I'm here. Just open up and give yourself to me. And I start going into prisons, and, uh, and I... Uh, you know, it was just leading a lot of people to Christ. And I was teaching a, a message in, in Topeka Women's Prison. And uh, I think there, there was like, I don't know, we used to get anywhere from 110 to 180 women in that room. It was just the most amazing thing. I mean, you were in some of those services, right? It was the most amazing move of God ever. And I was teaching on grace. And as I was at home studying, you know, we all, when we think about grace, we think about the goodness of God, right? Just grace. I mean, I don't know what grace means to you, right? But when you say grace, you know, you, certain things come to mind, right? And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm studying and, and I'm reading, excuse me while I get a drink of water. I'm sitting there thinking, man, my, I got, feel like I smoked a joint. I got cotton mouth. <laughs> I remember what it feels like. I'm just saying Email Pastor Rob. <laughs> so anyways, I'm studying in my office on grace. And the Lord just stopped me cold. And he says, Shannon, I like where you're going with grace. Now understand, see, I have conversations with God in the language that I know to have it in. Amen? And I like to hear God how I can understand him. And so sometimes when I, when I, when I know I'm hearing from God, it's just like in that conversation, you know. Like, I just remember saying, Shannon, I... You're okay. You're, you're kind of on the right path with grace. He said, but I want to show you what true grace is. And he brought me back to when I got shot. And see, I had told that story a couple times in the prisons and, you know, this and that. And, uh, but really never understood what, what was happening when I got shot. So he took me back and it was almost like I relived the whole thing. And I could see it like it was yesterday. And he said, the first thing I want to tell you is remember the heat you felt that you thought was from the bullet. See, I thought that's why I didn't feel no pain. I didn't feel the broken ribs. I didn't feel the lung collapse. I didn't feel the stomach broken four pieces. I didn't feel my diaphragm blown up. And I didn't feel the hole in my chest and the hole in my back because I thought the heat from the bullet was overtaking all that, right? He said, that wasn't from the bullet. He said, that was what happens when you go to hell. You spend time in the internal lake of fire. And he said, so that heat you felt. So remember I told you it was almost like a, a lighter that wasn't touching your skin, 
but it was close enough just to, to hurt and to burn, but not leave a char. Does that make sense? And he said, that's what the eternal lake of fire feels like. That's, who people, that's what people are going to be, live in eternity in it, when they go to hell. And I'm like, whoa. And he said, you remember the black wall, the emptiness, the darkness that you kept seeing that, that kept closing? He said, that is eternal separation from me. See, I can't explain that feeling. I can't explain that color because it wasn't black. It wasn't dark. It was empty. It was, just, it was, it was void. It was, it was the craziest darkness I'd ever seen in my life. And he said, that's eternal separation from me in the lake of fire. And he said, Shannon, you were unsaved at that time. I was thinking, and he said, that's grace. I loved you so much that even knowing what was going to happen for the next 15 years, the amount of lives that you were going to, to destroy, the amount of people that you were going to introduce to drugs, that was one of the things I battled with, self-condemnation in prison so many times. One of, one of my closest friends um, uh, in those days, I remember when I went to prison, uh, she no longer had the supply that I used to have. So just the vultures just swooped in on her and, and did some bad things. And, and that girl lived, you know, I, she's only been clean a year now as of today or maybe two years. Um, you know who I'm talking about? Okay. And, uh, I, I, you know, that for many years of my life, I, I, I was responsible for that. I felt I was responsible because I had introduced her to it. I had put it all in her, right? And, and, and then when it happened, so and the Lord had to tell me, you know, each person has to walk their own walk. So I had to learn how to forgive myself for that. So he said, Shannon, that's true grace. I loved you so much. Even knowing all those things that you were going to do, I still came running after you because I knew that one day you would say yes and that your, your ability and your anointing with me uh, working through you was going to do more good than any bad you could ever even imagine doing. Amen. I remember getting that word like it was just like God was just right in front of me. And it changed my whole outlook on grace. I mean, I love grace, but true grace is, is those people out there who are lost right now who are still alive that don't believe in Jesus as the only way to heaven, but they're still alive. That's true grace that God is still showing them. Amen. And if it's not for us, who is going to help them? That was the main thing I really wanted to share tonight was to tell you that, that I know that all of us are saved in this room, so we all believe in hell. But let me tell you, hell is real, and it is a scary place. And, you know, so I'm so thankful that the Lord and I got involved in a, in, a, in a church family and with a pastor who believed in soul winning because I really didn't know that much about it until I started coming to this church and, and getting Pastor Rob's heart uh, for Vision 2020 and to lead people to Christ. And that became my mission. You know, I was just like, man, I didn't care where I was. I've got film of me down at River Festival. Uh, myself, LaDonna, and Shannon Eichenberg, we went down to the River Festival. I was on a Todd White kick at this time. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go, Lord, because I believe in healing. So I went down to the River Festival, started just praying for people on healings. And we got healings on camera in Wichita at the River Festival. It's on my YouTube channel. You can go watch it. I mean, that's just the kind of stuff that the Lord, I used to do some crazy stuff for the devil. Amen. So if I can't do it, crazier stuff for the Lord, then shame on me. Some people will say, man, Shannon, you're always running. You're always busy. I'm like, you should have seen me when I used to run with the enemy. And here's the deal. If I could give him three days straight without no sleep, then I sure should be able to give the Lord. And he allows me to sleep. <laughs> Amen. You see what I'm saying? But if I don't go as, as fast and as strong for him as I did for him, shame on me. Right? Amen. I'm going to share a couple things with you to close this out. Um, I'm going to give you my four favorite scriptures first off. The first scripture is what took me all the way through prison. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. Very, very popular verse, right? But that's my life verse because in there it says, I, the part I love is where it says, I'm going to give you a future and a hope. See, because I learned that I, in prison I could have hopes up, man. I just got to keep hoping. And, and hoping causes you to have, hope is a substance of faith. Amen? Does that make sense? So I just love the word hope. You know, and Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I, before, I know who you, I have strong plans for you. And I, never meant for you to go through wrong and for evil my plans for you was to do good to give you a future and uh, and to give you success and hope right um the other one's luke 4 18 and 19 um let me read that one because that's a really good one
Luke 4, 18 and 19, when it talks about the spirit of the Lord is upon me, here's what it actually says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim to the captives. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Amen. Because, see, that's what I'm all about, going into prison and telling, man, you might be locked up and you might be bound, but guess what? You can be free. Amen. You can be freer on the inside than you ever was on the outside. Understanding you can change lives, not only in here, but when you get out. You see, all you got to understand is that we might live in a, in a country of democracy, but we're under a kingdom rule. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you tonight that when you leave here, I want you to know that you're, you are anointed by God to be somebody in your generation. See, your generation is the most important one right now. And you are anointed by God to be somebody in that generation. Amen? See, I'm still in my generation. And even though, and I posted on my Facebook wall this morning, uh, uh, and actually it was from Tony Evans, but it said, uh, 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 no matter what your past is, it's never too late. God's not done with you yet, right? Doesn't matter if you're, look, 80 years old, God used people, right? Doesn't matter. So <clears throat> you're anointed by God to be somebody in your generation, and that makes you significant. No matter what you've done, where you've been, what your past is, how many felonies you have or don't have, who you've robbed, stole, what you do in your hidden secret time, guess what? You were created to be something significant in your generation, and that makes you special. Amen? See, in today's society, I truly believe God has started to separate the wheat from the tares. Amen? I believe the harvest is coming, and he's separating the wheat from the tares. And, and tonight I don't want to tell you as he's doing that, understand this, where your gifting goes, your anointing will flow. See, where my gifting was that, man, I, I, I can just, I guess it's maybe a, let's just call it persuasion. I don't know what the best word to, but God has given me a gift to persuade. Amen. And sometimes you have to, pers when you give somebody the good news, you're persuading them to turn away from their evil ways of what they're used to, of what they like, of what they, what they feel is, is filling a void that they have. And you're persuading them to say, hey, there's something better out there. So where my gifting goes, my anointing flows. A amen. Does that make sense? Obedience equals success. And whatever God has you doing, if you're just obedient, you'll be successful. Amen. Don't let your circumstances fool you. I think it was Pastor Rob who said this. And I had it in my journal and I wanted, I wrote it on here because it's, it's stuck out to me. And I believe it was Pastor Rob that said this. Uh, circumstances have a way of becoming false prophets. Be careful of your circumstances around you. Don't let them become false prophets in your life. Amen. And when you're talking to people and, and, I'm, and, and you know, maybe you're sharing your story or your testimony, don't worry about if, if they'll receive it. Worry about not delivering it. Woo. Amen. I, know that I, don't, I don't know the address, but there's a scripture in the Bible that says, if I tell you to tell someone something and you don't tell them, their blood is on your hands. But if you tell them and they still go out, then their blood is on their hands. Amen. I'm going to read a statistic to you that, that I think, I know it shook me when I read it. Um, I'm really on this, this kingdom kick right now. And, and I know that, you know, we're all called. My other two favorite verses are Mark 16, um, uh, Mark chapter 16, 15 through 18, and Matthew 28, 16 through 20, which basically are the Great Commission, where it basically just says, go out and tell all the world the good news. Amen. Time is short. Go out and tell everybody because there's a lot of lost people out there. So I've been doing a lot of research on, on people in the church, you know, because I, I strongly feel that it's time for the church to rise up. But the problem is we've got a lot of lost people in church right now. Okay, and it's okay, but I do know that we're in a church, we're the life, that, that we, we have a live church. And I strongly believe with everything that's happening in Word of Life that God is going to use us in Wichita to branch out to a lot of places. Amen. I'm just, I, I felt that for a long time. Let me give you some statistics that I read about the Great Commission. Okay. Do you, can you believe, and this was just, this study was done in 2019, so this is not an old study. Listen to this. 51% of churchgoers in the United States do not know of the Great Commission. That's almost hard to believe, especially because we're in a church to where we hear about the Great Commission almost every Sunday. You know, when LaDonna and I moved to Kansas City, we visited probably 13 churches trying to find a home church. And uh, do you know in only one of those churches can I remember ever hearing a call for salvation? 
I remember LaDonna and I, we were so spoiled by Word of Life that you find yourself, I'm telling you guys, go search other churches, you'll find yourself comparing them to Word of Life because of what you hear. You know, and you're like, well, okay, man, it was the, the message kind of felt good, but they never even introduced anybody, asked anybody if they wanted to be introduced to Jesus. I mean, you can tell me something that I'll feel good all day long, but if I don't have the one who gave me the right to feel good, then I'm just a lost person. Amen? 51% of churchgoers do not know about the Great Commission. Only 17% know what it is. 25% have knowledge of it, but can't recall the exact meaning. And 6% are, just aren't sure. When you break it down into age groups, only 1 in 10 millennials, only 10% of millennials, 29% of elders, 26% boomers, 17% Generation X even recognize the Great Commission. These are people that go to church, mind you. This study was done uh, nationwide in churches. That's not us. We know what the Great Commission is. See, I came up here tonight just to tell you my history so that I could tell you my testimony of when God picked up that Bible and he said, son, how did you expect to win the war without your sword? See, that was my commission calling to say, stay in the word. I've got big plans for you. And then when he showed me the grace that he had showed me all my life, starting from when I got shot and when I rolled the BMW and when this happened and when I had so many stretch muscles around my heart that I didn't know how my heart was still beating, right? He said, son, I had big plans for you. And I knew because I know the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning, that you you were going to lead more people into the kingdom than you ever took away from the kingdom. Amen. Because see, what people who come from the lifestyle I came from, whether it was in gangs or on the streets or in religion, the one thing we ain't scared of is to go back to the hood. You see, I ain't scared to go back into prisons where I was once bound. That's why I love preaching in prisons because I can go and say, guess what? And the same thing that was said to me when I was in jail. Is I used to sit right there. As a matter of fact, in the women's prison, I can literally go there and say, guess what? I've sat right where you're at. And they'll be like, what do you mean? This is the women's prison. There's only women here. And it's the only women's prison in Kansas. Yep, but it wasn't always that way. It used to be a co-ed prison. As a matter of fact, the first time I went to prison in 1999, I went to Topeka. Now, it wasn't together co-ed, but there was women on one side, men on the other. And I got my prison number in Topeka Correctional Facility. So I literally could go back into the women's prison in those years later and say, I've been here where you're at. I, my number is 67742. I'm old school. Okay. And if he did it for me, he's going to do it for you. Amen. Because I ain't scared to go where the enemy thought he had gotten rid of me. See, he tried. You know, here's what's kind of crazy. The enemy can't kill you. It says the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but that's not physically, see? He, but he does a real hard job, and he works really hard to try to get you to kill yourself. Right. Two great things have happened in my life um, with my story. Um, I just got, uh, I'm getting published in a book um, called Hidden Gems. So I just got the part of my story that they're putting in it. There's like, I think there's 13 of us. Um, that uh, a guy wrote a book and he put our stories in it and it's going into prisons all across the United States. Yeah, so, and then I'm personally writing a book right now um, that really focuses around the time I got shot. Um, because I, you know, when God showed me that when I was doing that study on grace, it was about that same time when all those movies were coming out. Boy Who Went to Heaven, 90 Minutes in Heaven, Miracles. From, remember that time it was like the movies about heaven kept coming out. And I was like, man, you know, you know, these people that said when they died, they went to heaven. And the Lord showed me, you know, heaven's real. And, and I, you know, people are starting to talk about it. And I need you to talk about how hell is real because I let you experience it. And uh, so I just know there's a calling there for something. I haven't quite got it yet. So I'm on that, on that, uh, on that road. So be praying for me. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to finish with this. I believe that everyone in this room is getting ready to disappoint the expectation of the enemy. Right. Come on now. You got to accept that. Yeah. You're getting ready to disappoint the expectations of the enemy. See, I want you to leave here tonight knowing that your life makes a difference. You know, a lot of times when I get up here and I'm the facilitator and I get to close out the service, the one thing I love to end with is represent well. Because you truly might be the only Jesus that someone sees today. And here's the question that you can ask yourself. When they see you, do they see Jesus? So when you leave here, keep that in mind that, that you're getting ready 
to disappoint the expectation of the enemy because the enemy's kept the Jesus hidden in you for a while. Amen. But now you can walk out with your head high and say, I'm going to disappoint some expectations and I'm going to let everybody know who lives in me by the way I live my life. So that when they look at me, they see Jesus and they'll come to me because I'm a little shy right now about going and talking about Jesus. But that's OK. But maybe if I can at least live like Jesus, they'll come and ask me about him. Because, see, that's what happens when you don't say a word and people see it in you. They'll come ask you, man, we live the same life. We have the same problems. How come you're so happy? And you get to say, oh, glad you asked. Let me tell you why. Amen. Then you can tell them about Jesus, right? Be faithful to your purpose. Every day should present opportunities to walk in and on purpose. God bless you guys. I love you. I hope you got something out of tonight. So, amen. Listen, we never want to close the service without giving you an opportunity to give. Remember how I told you that the Lord taught me about tithing in prison, right? Here's another thing I learned, and you know, whether it's theologically correct, I don't even know if that's the right word. Sometimes I say words that aren't really words. <laughs> they, gave me, they gave it a name in prison, a language, actually the Donna did, she calls it Shannonism. <laughs> don't mind it, it, he's speaking Shannonism right now. <clears throat> but while I was in prison, the Lord started talking to me about tithing. He really started to tell me that, man, when you get a word, so into it. I mean, it, it's, it's not like you're giving money to the person that gave it to you. No, so into the kingdom of God. If God gave you a word tonight, man, I don't care if it's a dollar. I don't care if it's a hundred dollars. I don't care what it is. So into it. See, because you're sowing into good ground here. Amen. And, and that word, if you got that word and you sow into it, God will take that sow and, and through the many things that we're doing through word of life, it'll come back as a blessing to you amen so whatever you're believing for if it's to overcome addiction finally or if it's to overcome the hidden secret or if it's just to be more bold in your witness for christ right so into the word man so we give you that opportunity before you leave you can sow into this basket we love you god bless you if you're writing a check make it out to word of life if you got cash yes ma'am yeah, next week. So uh, Mark Jaquez is going to be here. Now, Mark, some of you might have seen him. He's the one that comes to church, has tattoos all over his head. I promise you he's got a, probably a pretty good testimony. Amen. Anyone that can tattoo their head has a testimony. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, one of the great things is the, for many of you that don't know, if you've ever seen little Marky in church, little Marky is the one that's in the wheelchair and has the skin disease. Uh, Mark is his stepdad. So think about what type of man Mark is to help raise that young kid. Amen. So I hope you all come back next week to hear him. Uh, the week after that, I believe, is, is you, right? Mr. Taiwan, who on a Wednesday night one time drove by and said, I'm just going to go in this church. And we happened to be doing Moses in here and, and something spirit knows spirit. And I looked at him and I said, hey, man, do you want to come and give your testimony? And he's like, yeah. And I remember telling LaDonna the whole next week going, oh, my God, what did I do? I don't even know this guy. I'm like, please, Lord. And come to find out he has a book that, that he wrote of when he did time that is full of poems that will knock you off your socks. So I can't wait to hear his testimony as well. Then we got Jose over here coming, and uh, I don't know much about Jose's story, but I've heard some things, and uh, he's from the West Coast, I believe. Is that right? Used to run with some pretty, uh, some pretty uh, 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 mean people. So, um, you know, he's, God delivered him from some things. So I think he has a, a, a long life of gangs. I mean, wasn't you in a gang for a long time? So, so we're going to hear from that. So we got a strong month pulled, pulled together for you guys, okay? God bless you guys. Amen. We'll, talk to you, we'll see you Sunday at church.